You are listening to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast. I am your host, Luis Mojica. I'm a holistic therapist, and my goal is to teach people how to find safety in themselves. I use nutrition, herbalism, self-inquiry, and somatic therapy to heal the body and mind of trauma. I have learned that each and every one of us has the ability to heal, to love, and to access all of the answers we're looking for. To do this, we first need to learn how to listen to our bodies and understand our minds. Let us begin. Today's episode is all about fawning. Fawning is a trauma response. It's a learned trauma response. And I'm going to start by reading a post I published to Instagram a month or so ago. And I'm going to take pieces of that post and go deeper into it for this episode. Fawning is indeed a learned trauma response. It's the fourth big, not often spoken about F after fight, flight, or freeze. However, it's often the first. Fawning is when we appease people, people please, pretend we are happy when we're not, and even consent to things that we regret or don't really want to do just to spare hurting someone else's feelings or being seen as not nice. Fawning is widely displayed and taught, innocently of course. We teach our children to fawn by saying smile when they don't want to. We tell them to say thank you or hug your uncle when they don't want to. We teach them to override their intuition and needs in those moments. That by repressing their own feelings, they're sparing someone else's disappointment or embarrassment. We are teaching them how to break their own boundaries just like we were taught. And then we call it nice. So we grow up being valued for being nice or bypassing our emotions. And then we meet someone who takes advantage of us and we let them because we're nice. The shadow of fawning is deep resentment and aggression. I've sat with many men and women who use this strategy, and when given the opportunity to feel how they really feel, a lot of hatred and even violence emerges. This is just the necessary swing of the pendulum, because every fawning moment is a boundary break. Resentment and aggression exists to protect those boundaries or show us where they're being permeated. When we stop fawning, we also stop being angry. Where have you fawned? Do you still do it? Do you smile when you don't want to? Do you hesitate to say no or talk around the no? Where do you please others to the point of draining yourself? Let's first see where we do it, then learn how to build the capacity to handle the disappointment of others so we can stop fawning stop being angry, live more authentically, and no longer teach it to our children. So the first part I want to magnify, amplify, uh, teach you about is the term trauma response. Another term for this is threat response. It's important to understand what this means so that you understand what fawning even is and why we even do it. Trauma or threat response is the response the body has to a perceived or imagined threat. So if your mind or your body experiences danger or thinks it's going to experience danger, you will somatically have a response. Somatic, somatically, this word, these words just mean bodily. Body response, somatic is in the body. Okay. So anything relating to the body, its physical sensations, its biology, its emotions, how it feels, the physical sense of the body, how everything shows up in the body, is referred to as somatic, somatically, the soma, soma being body. So we have a somatic threat or fear or trauma response, it's all different names for it, when we perceive or experience danger. This is key to our survival. The reason any of you are listening to this, the reason I'm able to record this, is because we all have healthy bodily threat responses. Simple examples day to day. You're driving in your car and an animal runs out in front of you. You have an immediate threat response to slam on the brake. Okay? 
you're walking in the park and a shadow passes over you and it looks like a ball. And you look up in the sky and you see a ball and you cover your head. That's a threat response. You see somebody who scares you. You see somebody you know who you're avoiding. Your body tightens up or it runs the other direction. That's a threat response. These are these really simple day-to-day -day threat responses. Big loud noises, a car horn beeps, and you jump back from the sidewalk. So this is something your body does. I like to call it a mechanism because a mechanism can be likened to sneezing or coughing or yawning, something the body just does for survival. We don't always know why, and we don't always really care. We just have come to accept it. I want us to see threat response in that category of mechanism because until it's conscious and until you learn the roots of it and how to actually see it and feel it as it's happening, it's unconscious. An unconscious threat response is a mechanism that your body developed through childhood based on whatever situations you were in. Now, there are much more severe threats that cause big threat responses as well. I listed a couple simple day-to-day -day things. There's the, the typical imagery of war and a war veteran and the trauma they go through, explosions, having to kill somebody, being attacked. Those are major threats. There's the example of living in an abusive home whether it was sexually abusive, verbally abusive, physically abusive, and your little nervous system growing up experienced threat in the house. That's, that's threat response. And I should actually say that's threat. The threat response would be probably to freeze. If you're a little kid and there's something very dangerous in your orbit, your environment, you're going to freeze. You're going to shut down. You're going to hide. That's freeze response. Okay. Fight, flight, or freeze. Those are the three. So, if you're understanding what a threat response is, I'll say it one more time so we can all really feel it. A threat response is when your body has a reaction to a perceived or real threat. Again, a threat can be anything as simple as you see a scary movie when you're three. It could be a nightmare. It could be an animal running out in front of your car. Or it can be as large as your life is actually being threatened. You are being assaulted. You're being abused. You went to war. You had to kill somebody. You almost were killed yourself. Big car accidents. There's a spectrum. What's important is the spectrum is the event. So the events can go from kind of like low level to really severe threats. And we can, we can judge those. We can quantify those however we want to. But the responses I have found are pretty similar. What makes someone's trauma deeper or more severe than someone else's is the repetition of the threat. Okay? So someone that experienced one thing is going to have a different response in their body than someone who experienced that same thing over and over and over and over again. Okay? I'm going to go more into that in other episodes, but I just want to make sense of this threat response for you so you can understand how fawning fits into it. Fawning is interesting because it's, it's really the fourth threat response because you're not fighting, you're not flighting, and you're not freezing. Although there are elements of those. What do I mean? So if you think of a freeze response, a freeze response literally means you just get still. You don't speak. You shut down. You may dissociate as well. There isn't a lot of movement. Sometimes when you're fawning, you are also freezing. You might want to be walking away. Instead, your body is frozen and you're staying there and talking to somebody you don't want to. There's some element of freeze there. I also see elements of flight, not biologically where you're, or physiologically where you're actually running away from the threat or leaving the person or running from the scene or shaking your leg. But there is this almost um, intellectual form of flighting. You're not being seen because you're reflecting back to the other person what they want to hear. So you're becoming a bit invisible in the relationship, 
in the conversation, in the dynamic. And that's part of the goal of the fawning body. It doesn't want to be seen because it doesn't feel safe to be seen. So I don't want to confuse anybody with throwing those elements of flight or freeze in there. And a lot of therapists don't agree with me with that. Some do. So it, it's uh, up to you how you want to attach to any of those. I find it helpful because when you start becoming aware and embodied while you're fawning, you'll feel where you're frozen. You'll feel where you want the flight. You'll feel where you want the fight. So these, these threat responses will become more online when you're in the moment of fawning with somebody. And you can only know if you're in the moment of fawning if I describe, really describe what fawning is. Like I said in the opening, the easy way to put it is people-pleasing. Fawning is a way we people-please. How we fawn is very different from person to person. Some of us fawn by over-complimenting. We just tell people how great they are over and over and over again. Another way we fawn is by telling someone we want something when we don't. It can be as simple as, I really want to see you. It can be as intense as, yes, I want to have sex with you. Most of our sexual trauma comes from fawning. I use the term sexual trauma here because it's really important to understand what I'm saying and not take these words out of context. When I say that a fawner says yes to sex when they don't want it, I'm not talking about rape or assault. I'm talking about your lover. I'm talking about your boyfriend or girlfriend, your partner, someone you trust, someone you're dating who's kind and gentle with you, someone you've known for a long time. This is also why I say that the person wants to be intimate with you because there's nothing intimate about sexual assault or rape. I want to make this clear. My example of fawning and sexual trauma means that the person fawning says yes with their words and with their bodies to make the person they are with happy. It could be the first date. As long as that person isn't holding you down, forcing you down, or threatening you, then you haven't experienced assault. However, you are experiencing sexual trauma because your body isn't doing something it wants to do. Okay? Your body is doing something it doesn't want to do. Is that your fault? No. It's a trauma response. It's something that takes over. And it's important to understand how dangerous it can become in these situations. And this is how many fawners will experience sexual trauma as if they were assaulted with no history of assault. I've had so many clients for years try to find the moment they were assaulted or molested or something happened to them that was inappropriate. And as we do the somatic experiencing, we learn, wow, with your husband of 30 years who you love and have a brilliant relationship with, there is a boundary break around sex because you're actually not doing what you want. You're actually doing what you don't want because you're afraid of disappointing. You're afraid of not being enough. You're afraid of being abandoned. And this could be true for men, women, non-binary. If you're using your body sexually with someone you love and trust, who loves and trusts you, who takes care of you, you take care of them. If you're using your body in a way that doesn't work for you, you're breaking a sexual boundary with yourself, and that is a sexual trauma. So you can be sexually traumatized with no actual assault. And that's so important for everyone to hear. Because when I speak about this, I'm speaking about it through the lens of a boundary break from fawning in a sexual way with your partner. If we're talking about assault, again, assault is when someone is threatening your life. They are breaking your physical boundaries. You are drugged. You may be crying, you may be screaming, you may be running, you may be saying no. You may be saying, I'm not comfortable with this. And they're not listening to those boundaries. 
That is an assault. That's when there's an assault on your body and your mind and your emotions, your psyche. If you are experiencing sexual trauma without the assault, it's because your body is doing things it doesn't want to do out of fear of being abandoned. And that is going to be held in the body as a sexual trauma the same way it's going to be held as if you were assaulted because they're both boundary breaks. And the somatic boundary we're talking about here are the sexual organs, usually. But we could just say the body, okay? This is no one's fault. Sexual trauma from fawning is no one's fault. And so many of us do it. I spent a decade doing it. And like I said, it's held very similarly. So it's important for me that I'm explaining the difference really, really uh, in detail. Because there is a prevalence of sexual trauma in our society without sexual assault, without molestation, without any kind of force. And we either don't know we have it, or we're told that it doesn't count because we weren't assaulted. We can't find the event. If your body is doing things with someone else's body that you don't actually like, but you're too afraid to say anything, that is a sexual trauma on your physical sexual organs and any other part of your body that's, that's being um, involved. So this is important because fawning almost always lead to fawning sexually in your most trusting, safe relationships. So fawning becomes a physical trauma response as well. Physically gesturing your body so someone thinks you like them or even love them or are attracted to them. That's the way we typically tend to think of fawning. In this case, you'd be gesturing your body in that way when you don't feel that way to the person. I personally, one of the ways my fawning mechanism expressed itself was through flirtation and gesturing wildly to the point where I didn't, I didn't even know I was doing it. So I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to turn my hips to this person and twirl my hair and look at them deeply in the eyes. I wasn't thinking that, but that's what I was doing all the time. And I garnered a huge following of people who wanted to make love to me and work with me and be my friend and spend time with me because I made them feel really good. But I was fawning. There was nothing authentic about it. So I'd walk away feeling really drained. And I couldn't understand why. And I couldn't understand why I was, it, they were so enamored by me. And then I started learning, oh, okay, because I'm giving them a reflection of what I think they want. And this was all unconscious. This was a mechanism. And that's the real, that's the real goal of the fawner. We are trying to reflect with our bodies, with our words, with our gestures, our eyes, our feelings, our felt senses, our emotions. We're trying to reflect back to the person what we think they want. So we don't have to be seen. And that's the really difficult piece here being seen, visually being seen, being seen when you say no, that's a big one. Saying no is being seen. The person or persons are witnessing your preferences, witnessing your truths. And your truths are really just your boundaries. No, I don't want to go for a walk with you right now. Feel that. What does your body do when you imagine saying no to someone else's needs, to someone else's invitation, to how someone else sees you, to how they see the world, to how they see themselves? How does your body hold the experience of disappointing another person, of creating conflict with another person? Take a couple seconds. Close your eyes, take a breath, and just notice what's happening in your body right now. This is really important information. Not what I'm saying, but what you're feeling. 
you are able to feel or experience right now what happens in your body when you think you're going to disappoint somebody. And if you feel overwhelmed or you feel numbed or you feel stressed or you even dissociate, which means you kind of stop feeling your body, you leave your body, you are someone that 99% is going to fawn as a response to deflect and uh, quell any disappointment or conflict. Why? You know, why don't we want disappointment? Why don't we want conflict? That goes way back to developmental years, to childhood. And I'll get there soon. But how it shows up in the adult body, or even the young adult body, or the teenage body, is absolute overwhelm and dysregulation. Dysregulation is what we're experiencing when we have a threat response. When we perceive threat, the body dysregulates, which means it doesn't feel safe. So the chest will tense up, the heartbeat will increase, breathing will get shallow. Sometimes you lose track of your legs or your arms. They just don't feel like they're there anymore. You might feel nauseous. Your fists might get tight. Your shoulders might clench up. Your jaw might clench shut. Clenching, constriction, building of pressure. These are the most typical characteristics of dysregulation and of feeling threatened. Now, that's happening because the body's building up a charge to release it into that fight-flight response I talked about earlier. Freeze response is when we just bypass the charge. We shove it down and we dissociate. So I'm going to go into all these in another episode in, in, in depth. But it's important to look for the constriction because that constriction is the motivating factor to fawn. Because when you're looking at someone and you think they're not happy with what you're saying and you feel discomfort, your body is going to do anything it can do in that moment to get rid of that discomfort until discomfort becomes comfortable. We have to build the capacity in our physical nervous systems, in our organs, in our limbs, in our mouths, our eyes. It's like training. We have to physically build the capacity to withhold, process, integrate disappointment, other people's disappointment. If you're fawning, you aren't able to do that yet. And that's okay. No one taught you. You're here. You're learning. Let's take a quick break just to pause and take this in. Maybe write some things down in your journal. Take a breath, see where your body is, get some water. And I'm going to talk more about how childhood and our parenting creates this. Welcome back. So I'm going to talk a little bit about childhood and a little bit about parenting and how we pass this on to our children and how we developed it as children. Now, before I go into it, I have to separate two things, manners versus fawning. It's a very, very fine line, and it can be difficult to understand the difference. Some of you may hear me say, wow, Teaching a child to say thank you, those are manners. That's not fawning. I'm not going to tell my child not to say thank you. I agree with you. Manners are essentially just seeing someone. It's a gesture. It's a, a verbal offering that says, I see you. You exist. I respect your presence. Which means someone gives me a gift. Or someone cuts in front of me. Or I bump into someone. I say, oh, thank you for the gift. I say, oh, did I run into you? I say, oh, pardon me, I, I bumped you. Those are manners. And again, they're just showing the other person I see them. I think that's beautiful. It's beautiful to show people we see them. It's beautiful to show people I'm aware of your existence. We all love the way that feels. Now, the fawner goes an extra step. Let's say I bump into someone and I'm a fawner. 
oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Are you, are you okay? You know, I am so clumsy. I'm just always falling. I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I bet you never do that. You know, actually, every time I see you, you're really, you're just so, so solid. I wish I had your posture. How, how's everything going? Tell me all about you. So as I'm role playing this fauner, which unfortunately is is a carbon copy of who I once was, I can feel the tension in my chest just role playing that because it's a panic driven state. And other people who are receiving that fawning, they're either loving it because they really want that kind of attention and they want that kind of admiration. So they're going to feed it or they are so overwhelmed by it. And they're either going to call you out or they're going to just want to avoid you. The people who call you out are your friends. You want them in your life. They're going to tell you every time your mechanism turns on. Is it their job? No. Is it anyone's job? No. It's your job. It's my job. We have to notice it for ourselves. However, some of us may be lucky enough to have partners, friends, coworkers, strangers, who call us out on it. And instead of taking it personally, let's take it like a gift. Thank you. I don't want to do this to myself anymore. Okay. So that's the difference between manners and fawning. Again, fawning is people pleasing. Saying thank you isn't people pleasing. Everything after the thank you, everything after the excuse me, that's where we start going into the world of I'm going to tell this person what they want so they leave me alone, so I don't disappoint, so I don't offend, so I don't hurt. Now, how do we learn this? It's very, when I say innocent, I mean innocent because to me, anything unconscious is innocent. You don't know better. Think of your parents. If you had the kind of parents that said, you know, you had to sit on someone's lap even if it felt uncomfortable. Or you had to let people touch your cheeks or touch you even if you didn't like it. Or never hurt someone's feelings, always tell them what they want to hear. Or don't speak up. Or it's very selfish for you to say what you want. It's very selfish for you. Never say no. People need you. We're here to be of service to other people and give them what they need. Family sticks together. All these concepts, which I can get into more, are very beautiful and can be very healthy. But I'm looking through all these through the lens of fawning. So if you were raised with that kind of structure, you were raised by a parent who is also fawning. Your parent has experienced things in their lives that they may or may not remember that were very scary. And they learned if they told the person what they wanted to hear, if they did what the person wanted to do, then they were able to be free. They were able to survive another day. And again, like I said, this can be very simple. It can be just uh, being really nice and friendly to a classmate so he doesn't make fun of you, which isn't very simple. It's terrifying when you're a child. Or it can be something very, very um, high-level threat, like sexual assault, physical assault, near-death experiences with people. Fawning is always relational. You're not going to get in a car accident and start fawning. But you might get physically abused and learn, wow, when I smiled more, when I got my parent their breakfast in the morning, when I said really nice things about them, I got hit a little less. This is the generation of people who are raising more and more fawners. And it's not just women. Men fawn as well in a different way. We see women tending to fawn by over-smiling, by um, over-complimenting, saying I'm sorry a lot. Listening to podcasts and news anchors and anyone being interviewed, if you see a group of men and women together talking, the women are constantly saying I'm sorry and they laugh and smile after someone cuts them off. Now someone cut them off and they're saying I'm sorry and they're laughing and smiling. They're fawning versus you just cut me off, that's okay. Now, men don't tend to go into the I'm sorry and laugh and smile. Men tend to be of service. Men tend to do whatever anyone around them needs them to do. They may not have the emotionality women have, and they may not be catering to the person's emotional needs the way a woman might. But men will still 
show up and do things way beyond their needs or boundaries to prove their value or their worth. That's how men fawn. And I am being very polar right now. I am like an intersex, a gender fluid person. So I'm not believing that there's one gender or one, one, I should say one gender stereotype. I don't believe in those at all. But biologically speaking, men or women, based on their hormones, will come off differently with other people. Men with more estrogen, women with more testosterone, they'll react the other way. And this is all general. Of course, there's always room for, um, room for the contrary, right? So we want to understand that through developing in a family system where you were told these things, developing in a family system where you watched your family doing these things, or developing in a family system where you just did these things out of survival. No one told you to fawn, but the way you were treated, the way you experienced different treatment, you would learn, oh, wow, when I fawn, I get this. What it really comes down to is, was I supported in my honesty? If my honesty was going to hurt or disappoint or um, embarrass or make someone uncomfortable, how much was that supported? How did I learn manners versus being dishonest? Did I learn that I was allowed to have a no? When I was five and six and I wanted to be alone in my room, was I pulled out and I had to smile and talk to people? Or was I allowed to just be in my room and be alone because I felt more comfortable? How was your honesty supported? Fawning is the result of honesty not feeling safe. Your honesty didn't feel safe, doesn't feel safe. So you fawn. You become dishonest. You give people what they want so you can be left alone. Now, what all this does to the body while we're fawning is break boundaries. The physical body might be saying, I don't want to see this person. I don't want to be going on a walk. I don't want to be at this party. That's going on inside. The mind is saying that. The nervous system is saying that. But the gestures, the words, the tone of your voice, your eyes, your posture, Everything is saying the opposite. So you, by fawning, are essentially breaking your own boundaries. And then other people are breaking your boundaries because they don't know that you're not enjoying yourself. This is controversial in the topic of sexual assault because many people who have experienced being assaulted sexually will be blamed because they wore a beautiful dress or they didn't say no. And this work on fawning is not to validate that concept, that it's the person who received it. It's their fault for what they put out. I would never stand behind that, so I want to make that very clear. However, it is important to understand if you are someone who fawns, you are telling people the opposite of what you want all the time. And the more aware you become of that, the more embodied you are in your truth. And then the more your reality, your friendship circles, the life you live, the world you live in, that will become more congruent to your truth. Because if you are a fawner, you have this inner truth that only you and maybe one other person knows. And you have this whole world and community built around you who doesn't know you. You're a stranger to them. Your needs are unknown. They think you're somebody you're not because they like the person that they think you are. They like the person who you'd rather let them think you are because it's too hard to disappoint them, too hard to lose that role. You know, for me, it was really hard to lose the role of the guy who just made everyone feel like he was in love with them. I liked that community. I liked that attention. I like that. Uh, it felt almost like a loyalty I had to them. And I had to really grieve and mourn that identity so I could stop fawning. So if I didn't smile back all the time, or I didn't stop to talk for 30 minutes when I was walking with my family, if I had my own needs and my own truth and my own needs and my own truth being expressed were my boundaries, 
it wasn't about them. It was about me. And I got to sit back and start watching. Who likes me? Lucky for me, a bunch of people still like me. And some people don't. And that's something that I build capacity for. I understand why they don't like me. I don't hold it against them. And I will learn to feel in my body how safe it can be to not be liked. Because if you listen to what my first episode, you'll hear my own childhood trauma that I went through with my peers and why it felt very unsafe for me and threatening to not be liked. So it's important to see when not being liked equaled threat, equaled danger, we fawn. It's a survival response. Now, going back to the boundary break, what happens in the body when a boundary is broken over and over and over again is resentment and rage. Anger, resentment, and rage are all emotions that are showing us that a boundary is being permeated. So if we're angry, that's like an easy way to a low level. Oh, I'm angry. That thing you're feeling, that tension, that's the wall your body's building for you because you're not aware what you need yet. Then it becomes resentment. We make it about the other person. I can't stand to see Marsha because Marsha just talks and talks and talks. She drains me. She needs to stop talking so much. No, I need to stop showing her that I like how much she talks. And I might do that by actually saying, I really like you, Marsha, but I don't actually like the way we communicate. I stand here and smile and nod for 20 minutes and you just talk and talk and talk. Can we find a way to pause and I can respond to you? Or maybe sometimes, are you okay if I just say, I, I can't talk today, I don't have the energy. Or maybe I just don't see Marsha anymore. If I don't see her, I'm avoiding her. So eventually I'll have to see her and I'll fall or I won't. I've come to just love the, the honest communication about myself. Not about Marsha talking too much, but about my role. So ask yourself, if you're resenting somebody right now, what's my role? And this is for fawners, of course. What's my role in the fawning? How am I showing up to this person and telling them with my words, my expressions, my gestures, my actions, how am I telling them that I approve the dynamic of our relationship? Do I have the courage to tell them I don't approve it anymore and not make it about them, but own exactly what I'm doing and tell them that I'm going to start changing what I'm doing? A powerful thing happens when you start changing what you're doing, other people change how they respond and react to you. Okay? It's powerful. Because if I'm friends with someone that wants to talk for 30 minutes straight, I don't know why they have that need. I don't know what they've been through. I don't know where their mind is. They have a need to talk for 30 minutes straight. And I was a magnet for friends like that. If I decide to respond differently, like, you know, I'm the kind of person right now in this moment that doesn't want to listen for 30 minutes straight. So let's say three minutes in, I start to feel tense. I might say, well, I need a, I need a break. I haven't responded yet. Can I, can I take a moment to think about what you're saying and respond? That person is either going to love that or hate that, Right? If they don't like that I'm now responding or interrupting or not wanting to listen, they are not going to get their needs met with me anymore and they will find someone else who meets that need. That's the beauty of expressing your truth. You don't have to character judge. You don't have to change people. That's all very exhausting and impossible. But if you change how you show up, especially as the fawner, you change the reaction and people don't have the need for you anymore. So you start, you start creating relationships and friendships and communities that are symbiotic, that work for you, that reflect your truth as much as you reflect their truth. And to me, that's what symbiotic is. We are reflecting one another's truths and we're both aware of it. We may not agree or share the same truth, but there's a reflection that I hear it and I see it and you're safe with me. Practicing that expression of that truth will dissolve the anger and the resentment. The rage, the violence, the aggression, that will also resolve. When you get to the point of rage where you punch a wall, or you break things, or you hurt other people, 
you have been repressing your needs for so long that you feel so overwhelmed by that repression of needs that you're about to explode. And that has to be honored. The fawner will always create anger, rage, resentment. Very often passively. At other times, it will be sudden explosions. But that's the shadow of the fawner. If my inauthenticity is I love you no matter what, I'm giving you this, I I shouldn't say I love you no matter what. If my fawning mask is I tell you what you want to hear, because I mean, that's not really love, right? I tell you what I want to, what you want to hear. I'm exhausting myself and I'm going to hate that person. So healing fawning actually lets us show up to people more authentically and hold better love, practice, teach, express love better because we are part of the equation. So we respect ourselves. We know where we're at in our bodies. We're more embodied. And then we're able to actually give people what they need if we're able to. And if we're not, we can express that. And then we garner relationships where people are okay with it or we lose the relationships where they're not. And if you're losing a relationship with someone who isn't okay with your needs or your truth, you've just been spared. That's the kindest thing that person or the universe could do for you to remove that stressor from your life. And people, our our partners and friends aren't here to meet our needs. But as long as they respect them and they see them and they understand them, I call that a really good friend. So on the topic of boundary breaks and back to childhood and raising kids to not fawn, my mind goes right to physical containment. And I think of three, four, five-year-olds in preschool and how they start learning to be still, to sit still, to not wriggle, to sit crisscross applesauce. And using that as an example is really helpful because it's so prevalent and it's so innocent. Containment is important because what we're doing is we're, we're taking the uncivilized body, which is a child. It's not civilized. It's very wild still. It's of the earth, which is why we love children. It's beautiful. We're taking that body and we're trying to civilize it. We're trying to show it. This is what humans do, right? This is how humans act. This is how people act in the world. If you don't do this, someone's going to think you're weird or you're not going to get very far or whatever it is. So we teach them by starting to be still. Now, the problem with this is not containment. Containment is beautiful. I'm using containment right now to speak really kindly and very uh, trying to speak with awareness and intention. I'm not dancing around and laughing a lot and coughing. So I'm containing myself so I can give you a really clear podcast. The opposite or the swing of the pendulum is what we miss. We need holistic containment with children and ourselves, which means if we are sitting still, yet we have all this energy, so our legs are moving a lot, we're picking our our nails or biting our nails, we're shaking, we're shivering, kids wriggle and jiggle a lot while they're sitting on the floor, change position, that means we have energy, we have life force that wants to move and go somewhere. So if you're containing that life force for 15, 20 minutes in story time, or as an adult for eight hours in your cubicle, that has to go somewhere. So when we're done, we have to move it. Run, jump, laugh, play. When I think of children going from playing all day long, essentially, and then going into kindergarten or first grade, and they have 20, 30 minutes of recess, my heart breaks a little bit because the fact that they, they have to stop being in their bodies is, is a very primary very early trauma that most of us experience if we were in any kind of school. Maybe if you were homeschooled, you didn't, depending on how the parent was. But we experience being told not to do what our body wanted to do. So really early on, we're being told to break our boundaries and not listen to our needs. If I want to get up and walk away to the corner because the person next to me smells, or she's touching me, or she's making a noise, and I'm a three-year-old kid, and I want to move, and my teacher says, you have to stay still, I'm literally breaking a boundary. And I'm experiencing the overwhelm of that day after day after day. 
the teachers are not the bad people here. The system is not the bad people, the bad thing here. There's no bad thing here. It's an innocent concept and construct that's been passed down generation to generation. It's a lineage of trauma in a civilized society. I think of an uncivilized society. To me, the word uncivilized is actually a compliment. I think of primitive tribal societies of all races. I think of white tribes. I think of the pygmies. I think of Native Americans. Every tribal culture had movement, had dance, had a ritual, had a place almost daily, if not throughout the day, of moving the energy that builds up in the body so as not to traumatize the nervous system. When energy gets stored and constricted, it, the, the system, the nervous system gets traumatized. Trauma doesn't cause traumatization. Trauma, again, is your birthright. It's a charge that comes in to, to give you a response to protect you. It's a trauma response. The trauma being something that overwhelms the system, okay? And the system being overwhelmed, that's actually the trauma. So the event overwhelms the system. That overwhelms the trauma. And then we have trauma response. In that response, fight, flight, we use the fuel of trauma. That's the adrenaline. That's the stress hormones to escape. And then we regulate. But when that trauma builds up in the body, we become traumatized. So our children come home and they scream. They have tantrums. They want to eat. They want to kick. They want to yell. They cry. They are releasing the stored trauma of the day, the innocent stored trauma of the day. They are safe. We know that. They're not being threatened. They're in good hands most of the time. But their bodies are suddenly being told they can't do what they've always felt they could do. And for a child, movement and being able to express that creates safety. And guess what? The same is true for an adult. As a somatic therapist, the best, most beautiful thing I've learned is how much we all need to move. And in this civilized modern society, we don't. And we're taught that from a really young age. Sometimes we're shamed and even punished. I was in a daycare when I was three years old. And if you laughed during a movie, you had to stand up and walk to the corner and put your arms up in the air, sometimes for the duration of the movie. Now, that's called child abuse, and they actually were shut down. There was a, an investigation after I had gone there. But I never told anybody because I truly thought I was doing something wrong. So from such an early age, my body was, was actually punished and experienced discomfort and threat if it wanted to be honest, just to laugh, just to move sometimes, just to lay back and not look at it. So we want to teach our children you have needs, you have feelings, those feelings and needs are so important. So if you are at school and you are being told to sit still, let's learn how to sit still and then let's learn how to move it. And it starts by really looking at your educators, asking them if they're aware of this. Is it play-based education? Is it holistic? Is there movement? What's the discipline? How do, what, what's the stigmatization of a child who wants to move a lot? Is it ADHD? Is it Tourette's? Or is it creativity? Is it bodily? We want to look into all this. If you don't have the funds to send your child to a private school, or you don't think you have the resources around you for this kind of um, holistic child raising or, or teaching I'm talking about, you can do it. If your home is a lawless, open, loving space where anything goes, your child can come home every day and use that as a safe space to regulate. And creating a safe space to regulate in the home is invaluable because that's the same child who, as a 16-year-old, will come home after he saw something really scary at a party, who will come home after she was accosted by somebody. They will come home to the place that has been a safe container that they developed in. And for all of you reflecting on your homes, thinking, wow, that wasn't a safe container, you can understand even more why you fawn. And perhaps it wasn't a safe container because think of your parents' container. Was it safe for them? This is the lineage of trauma, the generational tradition of passing trauma down through the family. But lucky for whoever is beneath you, it stops with you because you're listening to this. Now, the remedy for fawning is practicing feeling safe in your truth. 
So we have to understand that this is a physical training. We have to physically work with our actual bodies, our nervous systems, our hearts, our lungs, our stomach, the physiology, the structure of our body, our shoulders, our jaw. We have to work with our body and notice when I speak my truth, what do I feel? Is that comfortable? Is it scary? It's an autopilot reflex that's so deeply woven in to avoid your truth if you're a fawner, right? So we can't just stop because it's a reflex. It's your body doing it. You're not choosing it. And this is true for most reflexes, but especially for fawn. Remember, because fawn is a way to avoid the conflict. It's a way to avoid what we think is the threat. So we don't really have a choice there. So step one is noticing it, the awareness of where do I feel it in my body? What does it feel like in my body? What do I do afterwards? How do I deal with the fact that I overcompensated or broke my boundary? Do I overeat? Do I cry? Do I avoid people? Do I stay inside? What do I do? This is the first step because we're just creating the awareness, the somatic awareness of what does it feel like when I'm about to fawn, when I'm fawning, and after. So that's step one. Then we have to really understand, well, fawning created safety for me as a child. Something I observed, something I was taught, something I learned, and it helped me escape certain situations and or it helped me be rewarded and loved. People loved me. I was rewarded for being nice, for being good, for making people feel good about themselves. That was a reward system that built up a sense of self, a sense of value. So I might still believe that my value and my, my worth comes from not offending, from not creating discomfort, from not giving people my truth. So just to understand where it came from, so you can have compassion with your body when you're doing it, and really for other people when they do it. Now I'm going to walk you through the somatic self-inquiry around fawning. So take a breath and get still, and we're just becoming curious and aware and noticing our body. Start right now. How does your body feel right now? Get comfortable if you're not. Move if you want to move, change the room, lay down, put on headphones, take off headphones, do whatever feels right. And just scan yourself from your head to your toes with your mind, with your breath, with sensation. How are you breathing? How does your stomach feel? How are your shoulders? How are your legs? Now, what we want to do is we want to notice how do I feel right before I fawn? So to do so, we want to find an event where we were fawning. Find a moment this week, recently. Something simple, nothing too, too um, traumatic right now. Something simple, like at the grocery store with a friend, or at school, or on the phone, or at work. And take a breath and just see, see yourself approaching this person before you fawned. You see the person. Pause the frame of that person and notice your body. Where am I constricting? Where am I numbing? Where do I feel pressure? Where do I feel stress? This is the first step. Where, what part of my physical being gets constricted and stressed when I'm about to see this person? That stress response, that physical feeling you're feeling in a part of your body, that's what propels you into fawning. So this is our early warning sign that says, hey, I'm waving the big F flag. You're about to fawn. So memorize this feeling. Now see yourself with them. Hear them talking, hear you talking. Notice what you're doing to fawn here. Is it a gesture? Is it what you're saying? Is it how you're looking? Is it what you're not saying? What are you doing to please this person that drains you, that goes against what you want or need, that stresses you out? And just see yourself. 
Feel how that feels to see yourself doing that. Just feel that. And let's remember as we're seeing ourselves here, this is compassionate. This is not to prove you're wrong or you're bad or what's wrong with you or you're weak. This is a mechanism. It's not your fault. So we're learning right now how to see the mechanism because when we're in it, we are unconscious to it. So we have to look back at it. So see the mechanism and see how your body feels when the mechanism is turned on. And notice what the mind imagines. What is the mind imagining is going to happen if you're honest? Are you going to lose your job? Is this person going to hate you? Are you going to be physically injured? What are you imagining is going to happen? That imagery, the thing you think is going to happen if you're honest, is really the root of the stress response. It's perceived threat based on imagined future. An imagined future can be from the past. It can be a past experience with this person that you're imagining is going to happen again. And you could be right. Imagination does not mean it's not going to happen again. It just means it's not happening now. You're imagining it's going to happen. And it's causing a stress response. And then you fawn. Feel yourself in your room right now. Open your eyes, look around, and really feel how you're here. You're alone. Feel where the stress is in the body and give it a little shake. Shake your arms, shake your legs. <sighs> Take some deep breaths. Take a deep chant like a vu. Vu. Really deep like that in your chest and your belly until you have no air left. Just do some movements. Put your hand over the areas that feel scared. Take some breaths into it. And just show your body how it feels to be here alone. You're not fawning. You don't need to fawn. You're away from the stressor. And let's feel the difference. How does my body feel when I'm not in the stress response versus how it felt when I'm in it? This is your first step to practice every day. Who am I physically in that response? What am I imagining mentally before that causes me to respond this way? And how do I feel after the response? Feel the relief. Feel the fear. Feel whatever's left, left over afterwards. And then go back to the situation and see what your truth was. So if someone asked me if I wanted to come to their house and I said yes, but really I didn't want to, I wanted to go home. Let me see what it feels like just to feel my need for wanting to go home. How does it feel? Ah, oh, it feels very gooey. It feels very tender. It feels very warm. It feels very open and calm. Yes, I really want to go home. I'm tired. I worked all day. I want to lay on my bed. I want to relax. I want to stare at the wall. I just don't want to talk to anybody. Okay, all those things you're finding, those are your needs. That has nothing to do with the person. Those are your needs. Now I want you to write down how you would communicate to that person about you, not about them. I'm really tired and just want to lay in bed. I feel overstimulated and I want silence. I love coming to your house, but tonight I am so needing just a bath and some alone time. See what kind of sentence you can put together that expresses to that person what you need, not what they did, not about them being great or not, but what you need and write it down. And your only work here is to be really clear as you write it, make sure it's all about you and your needs and breathe in the reality and the truth and the authenticity of that for yourself and work on feeling comfortable with that need in your body. When you've created the capacity to see your own truth and be comfortable with it and have clarity, it's that much easier to express that to other people because you have confidence, you have solidity, and you have clarity. So your friend can be really disappointed, but you know this isn't about them. So you can hold the disappointment. Oh my goodness, I'm so, I'm so glad you're disappointed. That means you really like to see me. I'm, I'm, I get it. And I really need that bath. Practice this every day and see what happens. 
Our bodies are magical. Our brains can transform. Our liver transforms. Our body regenerates. Our cells die. Things are always rebirthing. We are transformational creatures. We're not made to stay the same. And when we try, we experience trauma. So as always, before you go, take a breath. <sighs> Feel your body. Notice your emotions. And take that awareness into your life. I want to thank you for sharing this space with me. For more information on my work or any events that I might be hosting, please visit holisticlifenavigation.com. And you can find me on Instagram or Facebook at Holistic Life Navigation.